that's in that chalice is not just Christ, but it's every single Christian. And this this is why you know liturgy is timeless. I mean, you should take your watches off the of liturgy because everybody or every Christian that has lived, that is living and will live, is in that chalice. Um, I mean, which is, which is kind of phenomenal when you think about. Uh, I mean, even Christians that aren't even, you know, it's, 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 it's timeless, um, that were sort of taken out of that space-time continuum in, in, in liturgy. Um, and so, you know, it's just its basic um, idea is that the church is here on earth to make people sanctified. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why you know, the priest proclaims holy things before the holy, to remind that this is the reason why you're giving the Eucharist, and also number two, that if, if you're unprepared to receive communion, you shouldn't come on. Um, well, that would appear that the answer to Amy's question is that it would be proper to say that a living person is a saint, but I think implied in the question is, I think she was asking, she's tending children, I guess, um, but I think she was asking, is it proper to say um, that um, Peter is a saint? It was a pretty general question, but yeah, I wanted generally and particularly. I don't know, I don't know if Paul even does that. He doesn't do that. Because Paul not... doesn't say, like, this one person he is, is a, a saint. saint. No, he doesn't. He writes a letter to a general church and says, to the saints. Right. Which, by which he means those who are truly part of the church. Mm -hmm. and living I mean, that. when, you know, if Peter were to die and, the tr and, and God in his will chose to manifest Peter as a saint through miracles or you know, people touch Peter's relics and they, they, they he, they're, they're healed or um, his, his body starts oozing, and I'm not making this up because there are saints that do this, his body starts oozing a sweet smelling miraculous oil. Um, then that's kind of a, a flag from God trying to tell the church, ding, 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 this, this person's a saint. But that only really happens after death. Yeah. That happens after death. Yeah. So we talk, there's a follow-up. Didn't many saints perform miracles even before that? Yes, dying? even some saints, mm -hmm. even many, many saints performed miracles uh, during, during their lifetime. Uh, saint Nectardos. Um, yeah, there's, there's, if you read Acts, I mean, even the apostles were raising people from the dead. So, um, <clears throat> is that the slim sort of sign of uh, his divinity that he's here, or uh, of God's divinity, or, or um, I could answer partly that it's it is one of the traditional ways that we recognize the saint. Now, if God had chosen another way and said flowers would grow out of their mouth. Um, yeah, but what is his purpose in doing this? That's well, it's to, the, I think it's to let us know that this person was holy. Um, and, and to use them as an example? Well, another, uh, to use them as an example, but another another example is that a lot of the, these saints, some, some saints are incorruptible, mm -hmm. meaning that their bodies don't mm -hmm. decay at a, at a rate um, that a normal human body would decay. Mm -hmm. And what causes us to become corrupted is, is really the fallenness of the world. It's really sin. Um, and so it's, it's really a sort of a sign that this person was connected to God in a very special and intimate way. Do we make that a requirement for sainthood? Because I know that... Some Russians, I don't know if the whole Russian church does this, some Russians say, it comes up in the book of Karamazov, for example, oh, this person's body is decaying, so therefore he was not a saint. Like um, Father... Um, Father Zosima. Father Zosima. Yeah. Um, 
that is something that some Russians believe. I mean, some Russians believe. I mean, I, I think a lot of that is, is sort of pietistic opinion. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, I went and I venerated the relics of St. John Chrysostom in Constantinople. Um, the flesh is off his skull. It's a skull. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, was, it was kind of odd, you know, venerating a skull. Mm -hmm. um, it really sort of makes you think about your own mortality when you do that. Um, but he is, he's, he's just bones. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question or a point, Joseph? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There was, a, there was a few things I was thinking about. Um, one of the things which Arthur was, was mentioning is, um, I think the church allows uh, for the view that we, that we hope all mankind might be saved. Uh, and in that in, in that, in some way, we, we have the hope that all men may be saints. Right. Which kind of leads us maybe to um, a way of life, whereas we, we look at each other as a potential saint, well, and think... maybe as a living saint, mm -hmm. and we can look at each other with the hope of that when we see our fellow human beings. I think that if we do that, it would, it would cause us to sin against each other so much. I'm sorry, say that again. I said, I think if we did that, it would cause us not to sin against each other so much. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are supposed to look at other people and see Christ in them. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so it, it would change us a lot if we really could maintain right. that, yeah. even in, in the irritations of daily life. Right. Yeah. I think one other thought that I had, uh, a different thought, was with the ascending and descending picture there. Mm -hmm. there um, there's the scriptural image we have that, that Christ descended into hell mm -hmm. and that um, after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven. So through the scriptures and through our, uh, our practice in the liturgy, we really have that image mm -hmm. of the descending hell and ascending into heaven. And with the, when he was with the apostles and he ascended, literally he went up and they watched him go. He didn't just kind of disappear, mm -hmm. but there was really an, an ascending. Right, but heaven isn't like the sky, like a place yes. like Tahiti. Like, or, let's walk there. Like, let's walk there. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can't build a tower. Yes. We, we tried to do that. It was a pretty bad idea. <laughs> um, but I, I think that using this model and, and sort of using it crudely, um, I think that a lot of Christians have this idea that God is, is sort of separate, that he's up there. Um, and you almost get into sort of, you know, some sort of deistic idea of God being very removed, very remote from his creation, mm -hmm. um, when really the orthodox understanding of, of the world, um, as well as this, I, I guess what we call the metaphysical and supernatural world, it's, it's almost more like a marble cave. Um, I was having a discussion with one of my, one of, one of my catechumens, and we were talking about angels, we were talking about angel, and I said, yeah. He had this idea that angels were either like uh, sort of like a manifestation or an idea, or just like they were just up there. I think you used the word image in, in, in what you said, mm -hmm. and I think it is sometimes an, an image. Uh, Christ ascends because we associate higher with better, um, and descends because we associate lower with, with worse. Uh, so these, these are images, but like so many other things, when we, when we take them literally, and when, when we do that very Western thing of taking things very literal, very literally and very consistently, then we, we divide God's presence and, and the universe into, into a three-layer cake. Um, I wonder sometimes about um, how to take the literal and the figurative. Sometimes we distinguish the two so much it either has to be literal, um, and that means 
or it has to be figurative. And figurative kind of means false or something different. It shouldn't mean false. And literal means what it actually is. Yeah. And I think that's a false, I, I, I think, think that's a wrong way of kind of looking at literal and, um, and figurative. Yeah, I think it is too. Uh, I think uh, there sometimes can be a, a, a kind of mixing of both. Like it, things can literally happen and it can also be a sign or a metaphor of something greater. Right. And right. so that, that ascending and descending might, um, there might be some literal thing to it, like Christ literally well, ascended, but that doesn't mean that... The ascension is, is literal, I mean, yes. it's, it's described as he, he goes up, that but, that mean, but that doesn't mean that, that, that he, he, he goes up and, right. and finds a nice cloud to live on. Right yes. before he ascends, though, in the Gospel of Matthew, I think he says, I will be with you always. Right, uh -huh. <laughs> And then he, he leaves. Yeah. So there's a, there's a puzzle right there just in that one scene. Mm -hmm. But then he also talks about the, the coming of the paraclete, the coming of the Holy Spirit. The comforter. Mm -hmm. I mean, that gets us also into a lot of a weird, um, just a weird cosmology that a lot of people have. Um, and this is one of the things I think is the worst, worst, worst thing you can tell a mother or a father who's lost a child. Well, that child's now an angel. No. It's wrong, it's bad, don't do that. If you've done it, you're wrong. Because humans aren't angels. I hate to break that. Much to the horror of cartoons. Much to the horrible car uh, horror of cartoons. And we weren't angels before we were conceived. Right, we weren't angels before we were conceived. We, 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 we didn't exist before conception. Um, we, you know, our, our, our souls are created at conception. Um, Angels are a different, they, they are the bodiless powers. They are a different, if we can use this word to apply it to them, they're a different race than, than we are. They're a different people. Different species. A different species, almost. I mean, if you could even use the word species. No, you, you could. Really. Because they're, 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 not, they're, they're not terrestrial. Um, so they don't, you know, we don't become angels when, when we die. Um, and, and even then, um, uh, you know, another thing that sort of blew this catechumen's mind was when I told him that every Christian is assigned a guard, every, every human being is assigned a guardian angel. Um, in fact, there's a theologumenon, which is a pious saying, it's not dogma, but it's a pious saying, that when the number of, when the number of humans, saints, in heaven, levels out the number, or, or when the number of humans uh, replaced the number of fallen angels that fell uh, uh, and became demons, that's when Judgment Day will start. But that's a thing. Mm -hmm. By saying, uh, it's not necessarily dogma, it doesn't mean it's true. Um, but, you know, as, as far as, as, as with that, I, I think that that's, that's an example of sort of the, the weird cosmology that, that some people have developed here in the West, that they think that heaven is, I guess, sitting on a cloud and strumming a harp. That's, that's, that's a very boring. Sounds very boring. Yeah. That is a very boring concept of heaven. Um, in fact, I've been reading. Um, I've been reading Oswald Spengler's uh, *Decline of the West*, I think, um, and he makes a point, a very interesting point. Um, about different types of cultures. And Christianity came out of this Middle Eastern uh, culture, which he refers to as Magian, um, coming from the word you know, Magni. Which is you know, like, uh, like the Zoroastrian priests. But, but never mind about that. What, what, they, what he's saying is that they all follow similar cultural patterns. In Islam, I keep using that nasty blue color. In Islam, sometimes in Judaism, but not all the time. Okay? And in Zoroastrianism. What is heaven described as? 
Janna. Hmm? Janna? Yeah, what is, what is Janna? A magical place. It's a magical place filled with what? Virgins. Virgins? Yes. <laughs> Good, and? Wine, I think. Wine, yes! And? Good food. Good food? Yeah, you're getting close. And, 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 and magical unicorns that roam the land. No, I'm joking. <laughs> What is heaven in Christianity? The presence of God. It's the presence of God, but what is it often described as in the, by the fathers? Think of Augustine. Of course. I was going to say the, the supper. Oh, it's, uh, it's a city. It's a city. Oh, the city. different from these cultures. Very different. Because the reason why it's a city is because we already got this. We got this. We screwed it up. So, we screwed up the garden. So God's going to give us something better. The city implies lots of other people. It implies lots of other people. It implies connectivity. Community. Community. Um, Opera. Opera, you know. Well, I don't know, but 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 I mean, I mean, it's 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 a, it's it's very much a, you know. When I was I was living in Wyoming, it was very remote. It's a lot. It's a different. And, and Wyoming is beautiful, but there's a different feeling that people get. I mean, and some people like their solitude, but there's a different feeling that you get when you're out in the middle of nowhere, like out in Yellowstone, and then when you're in the city. So, I mean, these are these are very different different ideas. In Christianity, it's it's a city. It's a city that's ruled by God. It's the New Jerusalem. It's the city on the hill. Um, but we have many saints who went out to remote places away from the city um, and sought solitude. Um, how does that? Figure in. We'll talk about the practice of asceticism later. Okay. Um, but I mean, I guess we can tie 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 that in um, when we get when we start talking to classifications of saints. But you know, as far as asceticism is concerned, I mean, if you if you read the the life of Saint Anthony the Great, Saint Anthony the Great said that he he wasn't tempted when he was in the city. So when he was he was in the desert, he was really tempted. Uh -huh. That's when the temptations really started happening. Doesn't is it about him that there's a story of he's going to be shown someone holier than he is, and he's taken to Alexandria, and in the city he's shown a beggar or someone. I don't remember. I don't know. I can't remember. Who I, th I, I think I think that was that Saint Anthony, but I'm not sure. Story of You're thinking of Zosimon in Mary of Egypt. Yeah. Because Zosimon wanted to know if there was an ascetic that was, you know, can learn from that, was, that, was, that was greater than me that he could learn from. It turned out to be a woman, an ex prostitute. Um, so, um, I remember. It was a story about a monastic who wanted, who was shown two people that were holier than him, and mm -hmm. one was a, a single woman who lived with her single sister, and they didn't gossip. <laughs> and the other was a doctor with a family, and that he he provided for his family, but took more no more than he needed to sustain them. The yeah, mercenaries, which we had a list of in our service tonight. Mm -hmm. So, how are saints revealed? Saints are usually revealed through miracles. These can be miracles that happen during their lifetime, happen after their lifetime. Answer prayers. Uh, people um, asking for the for this dead the dead individual to intercede on behalf of God for them and happen. Uh, usually, a lot of times, recognition by a community, whether it's local or large. For example, Saint Raphael, Bishop of Brooklyn, um, that's very much a local thing because he's known to the faithful here in America for his.
the saintliness. And um, it was the local synod here that acknowledged his, his sanctification. Um, and a formal declaration involves a synod of bishops. Um, and that declaration does not make that person a saint. It just confirms what has already happened. That the church has looked into this and has officially added him to the canon of saints, um, or her. Um, and um, you know, canonization, the church does not make, does not, when, when we formally recognize a person as a saint, that doesn't make them a saint automatically. That's not the you know, the choir of saints or so. It's just recognizing something that has already happened. Well, isn't it true that all the recognized saints we, we would look at as those that we've identified and are certain of, and that there are millions of others. Yes, countless others that haven't been identified yet. Yeah. So classes of saints. Um, we talked about the angels, and um, I'm not going to get into the classifications of angels too much, um, like archangels and things like that, but um, I didn't mention guardian angels. Uh, apostles, these are um, the men, uh, the chosen um, 11, and then Paul, as well as the 70, um, who were Christ's closest disciples. Are any of the holy women that we associate with? There are women that we include in equal fields. So, for example, Mary Magdalene. Right. Um, Mary a lot of. Right. A lot of the um, a lot of the murmuring women. Mm -hmm. I believe Joanna, uh, my daughter's namesake, is she's considered to be murmur and equal to the apostles. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, women are included in there as well. Uh, prophets. Um, these are you know, it's interesting that we, we count and Catholics do as well, that we count Old Testament figures um, as saints. For example, David. Isaiah, these, these men. Now, do we, do we consider that there are still prophets, or that there have been prophets since Christ, or not? Well, prophecy is, is, is a gift of the Spirit. Um, it's a special gift. Um, but the greatest prophets were those that prophesied Christ. Mm -hmm. um, the last one being Now, so we haven't actually designated anyone since the time of Christ as a prophet. Well, to put it this way, pro prophecy is it's one of the offices of Christ. What is a prophet? Well, I think the, the ordinary view is that it's someone who foretells the future, but I, I in, a, in a course on them that I had uh, it's really someone who speaks a message from God a prophet is someone who speaks who, who tells and forms people the will of God and that's something that we're all called to we're all, we're all called to prophesy to, to be prophets um, you know this is this is one of the offices of Christ priest, king, and prophet who's famous for his sermons uh, would be a prophet. He might also be several other things, but that would be one of. Right, but we don't we don't really refer to. Him but we don't as, use as that prophet. Um, we don't use that when he he would be called a holy father mm -hmm. um, because he was a bishop. Um, but when we speak of prophets as far as saints, as classification, that would be the prophets in the Old Testament. Um, who kept the books of, of, of Moses and mm -hmm. of the Psalms and of David and these men um, that going all the way to John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. um, going all the way to the uh, Martyrs, these are, men, these are men and women who witnessed um, the faith, um, often, um, oftentimes going to their death um, to do so. Um, Within martyrs, there is sort of another subdivision. Um, 
And these are called passion bearers. Mm -hmm.